Hamilton, Ontario is about 45 minutes southwest of Toronto. Here can be found HMCS Haida. She's the last of the tribal class destroyers and is Canada's naval legend. If you had asked a Canadian at the beginning of the 20th century to tell you about their country's navy, which has more than 240,000 kilometers of coastline, their answer would probably be no longer than this sentence. At that time, Canada was the dominion of the British Empire, and the defense of its sea borders was entirely under the authority of Whitehall. The Canadian Navy didn't, didn't exist until 1910. Okay? And then the First World War, uh, we had one old retired, two old retired cruisers from the Royal Navy, but they, they did nothing. They just served as uh, depot ships, basically. And a lot of it was, did we even have to have a Navy in the first place? Uh, and there was a, 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 a the, there was, a, there was a, a big problem with all defense in the, actually in the 30s, do we even need it? And there wasn't really a goal, wasn't a need seen for the Canadian Navy. In the first half of the 1930s, Japan, Italy, France and Germany were reinforcing their navies with brand new destroyers, carrying powerful artillery and torpedo armament. Of course, Great Britain didn't want to be an outsider in this race. In 1935, British engineers developed a destroyer that was able to successfully oppose the most powerful ships of this type at that time, the Japanese Fubuki-class destroyers. It became known as the Tribal Class. As soon as the Royal Navy received 16 Tribals, British Dominions expressed their desire to obtain the newest destroyers as quickly as possible, because the drums of the European war were already heard across the oceans. Canada mobilized. One-tenth of Canada in 1939 had a population of 12 million. Okay. One, we had one million men and women in uniform. All of those people were volunteers. All the Canadian combatants were volunteers. So when you see those war graves in, in Normandy and in, uh, Amsterdam, in Holland, whatever, or in Italy, those people were all volunteers. During the war, as the Canadian Navy grew, mostly thanks to the addition of escort corvettes and frigates, its area of responsibility also increased, and in the end, included the entire North Atlantic. Each new ship, even a modest minesweeper, contributed to the combat capability of the Allies at sea. Destroyer Haida was laid down at the end of September of 1941 at a British Vickers Armstrong shipyard. The ship was commissioned two years later and was assigned to the Metropolitan Fleet. Specifications of destroyer Haida. Length, almost 115 meters. Beam, more than 11 meters. Draft, 3.96 meters. Total displacement, 2,519 tons. Armament, primary armament. 
six Mark 12 guns installed in three twin turrets, calibre 120 mm. Mark 16 dual purpose guns in a twin mount, calibre 102 mm. Anti-aircraft artillery, a Vickers Mark 7 quadruple anti-aircraft machine gun, pom-pom, calibre 40 mm. Six twin Orlikan autocannons, calibre 20 mm. Mine and torpedo armament, a quadruple torpedo launcher, calibre 533 mm. Two Mark IV mortars and an aft depth charge release gear. The ship carried 30 mines in reserve. Power plant, three Admiralty type boilers and two Parsons geared steam turbines. Power, 44,000 horsepower. Maximum speed, 36 knots. Cruising range, 5,700 miles at 15 knots. Haida's primary punch came from three twin 4.7 inch mounts. This was very heavy firepower for a destroyer of the era. They did come with a couple of advantages, as a few German destroyers discovered, but they also came with one significant disadvantage. The elevation was limited to only about 40 degrees on these mounts. In order to fix this, what they did was they replaced the 4.7s with twin 4-inch dual-purpose mounts, such as the ones behind me now. These could elevate up to 85 degrees and thus engage aircraft as well as surface targets out to about 14 and a half kilometers. From the very beginning, designers of the Tribal project put emphasis on reinforced artillery armament and planned to install five 120mm twin turrets, three on the bow and two on the aft. The ship was conceived as a destroyer leader and it was intended to partially complete the objectives of a light cruiser. Supporting squadrons of Allied destroyers, defending the main forces of the fleet against enemy destroyer attacks and carrying out long-range reconnaissance and patrols. One of the controversial design decisions when they were creating the Tribals was that they decided to reduce the torpedo complement in favour of the gun batteries. As a result, the Tribals were only equipped with a single quad mount for the 21-inch torpedoes, and these would go about 5 miles at 45 knots. The theory was that ordinarily the torpedo would be the main armament of a destroyer to sink ships, but it turns out in practice, hiatus kills were all done with gunfire. The torpedoes were aimed from the bridge wings, what would happen is once the trigger was pulled up there, a signal was sent to fire this shell casing, which has propellant. The gases would then expand within the reservoir here, push out the torpedo over the side of the ship. Of course, the stanchions will go down and then off towards the target. And each torpedo tube is labeled with a letter. And what you do is you always fire the aft torpedo first, because as the destroyer is moving, you want to make sure that they don't hit each other. Of course, having the ships is all very well, but they're not going to do very much without having the personnel to man them. Canada started off the war as basically a homeland defense force. She had six destroyers, a number of smaller vessels, and a navy of about 1,700 personnel. They had great possibilities for promotion though, because by the end of the war, Canada's navy had expanded to over 110,000 personnel and had the third largest amount of surface vessels in the world. Destroyer Haida began her combat career by escorting Russian Arctic convoys. At the end of December 1943, the German battlecruiser Scharnhorst tried to attack convoy JW-55B, which was escorted by Haida among others. However, the destroyer did not have a chance to participate in the destruction of the German raider. It was handled by her more heavyweight allies from the Metropolitan Fleet. At the start of the Second World War, the Canadian Navy came under the control of the Royal Navy. And they were, they were controlled, operated by, by, basically controlled by the Royal Navy. It wasn't until later on, again, as the Canadian Navy grew, that we were looking for our own, um, we again started, uh, became our own entity unto ourselves, okay? Just a because of size and B because of where we were. But by and large, yes, the Canadian Navy was uh, very much um, treated as uh, colonials and second class citizens. Except for, again, this ship um, and the tribals these, these were the, 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 the top, top of the forum, and they bested the Brits at doing the same thing. And the... 
In January 1944, Hyder was assigned to the 10th Destroyer Flotilla, which monitored the western part of the English Channel. On April 26th, during a patrol, her squadron discovered three German destroyers. Haida and her sister ship, Athabaskan, engaged the German T-29, which ended in the destruction of the latter. One and a half months later, roughly in the same area, a battle took place in which Haida made herself famous and brought glory to the entire Royal Canadian Navy. The 9th of the 9th of June 1944 saw Haida partake in a rather spirited and very chaotic fight against the 8th destroyer flotilla of the German Navy. The 8th was a small force consisting of three destroyers, two Narviks, a captured Dutch ship and a torpedo boat, whilst the 10th destroyer flotilla, of which Haida was a part, consisted of two four-ship divisions. The 19th was mainly inexperienced vessels and the 20th was, shall we say, the 18th. They had been told to intercept a German force which is known to be approaching the western ch approaches of the English Channel. And sure enough, a contact was made at about seven miles. The German destroyers spotted the Allied ships first when they became highlighted by the moonlight. The Germans launched 12 torpedoes, but their adversaries managed to dodge them. An artillery battle broke out, and the Allies had total fire superiority. Eider and Huron concentrated fire on Z-24 and quickly achieved success. Almost the entire above-water part of the ship was destroyed and set ablaze. The enemy attempted to flee under the cover of a smokescreen. The flagship Z-32 continued fighting against Tata and Ashanti on her own and took three hits. Z-32 turned right to put some distance between her and the Allies. Ashanti rushed after her. At this moment, the damaged ZH-1 became visible in the dissipating smoke. Her artillery quickly opened fire on Tata, but Ashanti arrived in time and torpedoed the motionless ship. The torpedo explosion tore the ZH-1's bow away. Ashanti kept firing on the German destroyer. At 2.40, ZH-1 exploded and sank. Later that night, Canadian destroyers were sweeping the area and stumbled across the heavily damaged Z-32. Fleeing from them, Z-32 was driven ashore on the Ile de Bats, where in the morning she was finished off by British Bowfighter aircraft. The Allies managed to destroy two German destroyers and damage two more. After the successful battle on June the 9th, 1944, Haida and her allies continued to complete missions aimed at removing enemy ships from coastal waters. During the fighting in the English Channel, Haida had a couple of advantages called radar. In fact, she had three of them. She had firstly a gunnery radar. This was accurate enough to spot fall of shot, both outbound and inbound, much to the consternation of the operators. She had warning combined, which is a fairly reliable radar, although it was well known to the Germans, and so the British and Canadians didn't like to use it unless contact was joined. And finally, she had warning surface, which was a pretty reliable radar, which would detect a destroyer sized target at about nine miles. All of these would prove vital in the night fighting in the English Channel. Despite the fact that the German surface fleet was virtually non-existent by the end of June 1944, the naval war went on. The more success the Allies achieved in the land operations, the more desperately and fiercely German submarines opposed them at sea. The time-honored method of dealing with an enemy submarine will be the depth charge, usually mounted on rails at the stern of the ship, or maybe fired off the side with K-guns. The problem was that in order to hit your target, you had to go directly over it, which meant A, that you lost contact, and B, you actually had to be accurate enough to do it. The end replacement of it, however, was the squid mortar. Haida received her squids in the 1950s update. They replaced both the depth charge rails and the aft gun. Now the advantage of Squid was it was adjustable in range. No longer did you have to ride over your target in order to sink it. And they were fired automatically by means of a simple electrical connection attached to the sonar system inside the ship. 
Haida has a U-boat kill to her credit, U-971 in 1944, as Haida was protecting the Western approaches to the English Channel during the invasion of France. Overall, the Royal Canadian Navy developed a reputation for ASW excellence. They sank about 30 U-boats, and in the post-war period, they became the de facto ASW force for NATO. During World War II, the number of people in the Canadian Navy grew almost 70 times. And in all those years, Canadian sailors developed their own understanding of naval service, which was slightly different from the traditions of the British Royal Navy. An interesting event in Canadian naval history happened in 1949 with what are known as the Canadian Mutinies. Now, the word is a little bit strong for what happened, uh, not least because the captain of Athabaskan accidentally on purpose left his cover on top of the written list of demands from the junior sailors, so he never officially saw anything. This happened on a couple of ships about the same time, not Haida, it should be noted. And what it really was was more of a sit-down protest pending an airing of grievances. And this came down to something of a cultural difference between North Americans and people from England. Where North American people, we tend to be a little bit more independent, shall we say, we like to know why we're doing, we like a little bit more consideration, shall we say, from up above, instead of simply being told you're going to do this when, you know, like it or lump it. The officers were more steeped in the tradition of the Royal Navy, the British Navy, which perhaps was a little bit more autocratic. The end result of this, it all worked out fairly well, uh, is that the Canadian Navy devolved new policies which took greater concern of the requirements, shall we say, of the junior enlisted sailors. Some people in the Canadian government believed that this incident was inspired by communist ideas, but this opinion was completely unjustified. Moreover, the destroyer was soon sent to Southeast Asia to fight against the Red Menace. Um. Again, the ship was converted to the way it is now. The armament was all changed, upgraded in 1951. And this is the way the ship was when it went to Korea in 1952. And that's where Cat, uh, Haida became famous um, when it joined what they call the Train Busters Club. And this was a method of trying to destroy North Korean uh, trains that ran along the coast at night. And it ran at night, figuring they couldn't be seen. So they ran it and it became a contest invented by the U.S. Navy to see if they could destroy these trains, the train buster. Um, in the history of the train busters club, there were 25 trains destroyed. Haida is second in train busting with, with two and a half. Haida's record has always been superb uh, gunnery, superb gunnery actions. In fact, the current Canadian Navy trophy uh, for gunnery expertise is named after Haida. It's the Haida trophy for gunnery excellence. During her second tour of duty in the Yellow Sea in 1954, Haida patrolled Korean shores, supervising the implementation of the ceasefire treaty supported by the United Nations. This was the first example of what we call today a peacekeeping mission, 10 years before this notion was introduced and became widely used. Haida reprised this role during the Suez Crisis of 1956. retired in October 1963 because again the life of a warship is basically 20 years and again at that time the Canadian Navy was expand then expanding they're building completely different types of ships and uh, again the men that were needed on the tribals were needed to man other ships so the, the tribals were scrapped and it was that time that a uh, next uh, naval person um, Neil Bruce decided that it'd be try to preserve the ship as, a, as Canada's greatest ship and just preserve it as a tribal. And they were successful in that uh, an organization was, was formed, uh, Hyde Incorporated, and they acquired the ship in, from Crown Assets in 1964. Um, they bought it for a, a huge sum at that time, $20,000. And it existed there as a museum, naval, uh, uh, you know, national historic site. If you asked a Canadian today to tell you about their country's navy, which has more than 240,000 kilometers of coastline, then you would definitely hear a long story full of brilliant victories and heroic names. Especially Haida, a destroyer of the Royal Canadian Navy.